Academic journals and academic research can also be a useful source of secondary information for marketing research practitioners. Journal of Marketing, Journal of Marketing Research, Marketing Science, the Journal of the Academy of Marketing Science, Journal of Consumer Research, Journal of Consumer Psychology. This is just a short list of academic journals that regularly conduct research that are of interest to marketing practitioners. However, if you're not used to reading academic journals, sometimes it can be a little intimidating to understand what academics are studying about consumers, how that might actually apply to everyday marketing practice. Let's give one example here. Here's an article from the Journal of Consumer Psychology in 2012. The title of the article is The Relative Visual Saliency Differences Induce Sizable Bias in Consumer Choice. That's a mouthful. However, it turns out this research could be very pragmatic and useful to everyday marketing researchers. For example, what we see here is one figure representing the results of one of the experiments that these authors reported upon in this article. In their study, they asked people to make a choice between two different products. In this particular case, one of the products was a product that we knew that the consumer strongly preferred. The example here could be peanut butter M&Ms. The other product was a product that the consumer did not prefer. However, this product was made visually salient or highly visible, something that you quickly and instantaneously noticed when you just glanced at it. So in this particular example, I picked Funyuns as an example. And to suggest visual saliency, notice how I brighten this up while the M&Ms are a little more darkened. So with these two products being presented to individuals, the idea was to see which product they would choose. Now in the long run, if the person had enough time, since we knew they preferred peanut butter M&Ms, you would suspect that the person always would select peanut butter M&Ms. After all, they didn't prefer Funyuns. However, that wasn't the case when we, when we gave individuals only a short amount of time to make their choice. Down here on the x-axis, you'll see a series of times. These are milliseconds, so this represents here one second. So there were five different lengths of time people were given to make their choice between the two products. 100 milliseconds meant they had a tenth of a second to make a choice, whereas at 1500 milliseconds, the person had 1.5 seconds to make a choice. In other words, a relatively long amount of time. On the y-axis, we see the percentage of which food product was chosen. So the orange area here represents the preferred product. And the blue represents the non-preferred but visually salient product. So when you gave someone 1.5 seconds, nearly everybody selected their preferred product. Very few people selected the product that was merely salient. However, when we gave individuals only a very short amount of time to make their choice, not quite half, but a large proportion of them chose the visually salient product and not the product they actually preferred. Now imagine if you're a marketer thinking about product packaging designs for low involvement or impulse buy goods. This would suggest that thinking about designing packaging that's actually visually salient might be a useful way to increase sales. So relative visual saliency differences induce sizable bias in consumer choice sounded like a big academic mouthful. But when we looked a little closer, we realized that this gave us some interesting insights that could apply to solving a practical marketing problem. Now, not all academic research resides in academic journals. For example, let's take a look at the American Customer Satisfaction Index. The AXI is an annual survey of approximately 70,000 US consumers covering over 300 different companies. The objective of the AXI is to longitudinally track how satisfied customers are with the various companies that they buy products from. What they do is they use both online and telephone based surveys to measure people's expectations, perceived quality, and perceived value of a company's offerings to create a composite satisfaction index score for that company. So when we say an index score, we mean that any given company could have an AXI score ranging from zero, meaning no satisfaction at all, to 100, meaning everyone is completely satisfied. The AXI is very useful for numerous reasons. But one of the things that marketers often do with the AXI is they use it to benchmark themselves against other industry competitors. Let's take a look at the AXI score over time for a select number of grocery stores. First, notice for the entire supermarket category that's measured by the AXI that customer satisfaction has stayed relatively stable within the category across the years 2014 to 2019. Notable dip in 2015 aside. Further, 
Notice how the relative rank order for customer satisfaction levels doesn't particularly vary for these select companies. Typically, Trader Joe's remains the market leader and Walmart remains the market laggard. This type of insight shows that customer satisfaction, at least for now, is a relatively stable phenomenon across competitors within this particular space. In other industries, which you can look up yourself by checking out the Axie, shows it's a much greater shift in how different brands and organizations compete to please their customers at a peak level. Everyday marketers have such a voracious need for useful information, many marketing research companies actually specialize in selling special commercial services that provide useful marketing information to marketers themselves. For example, let's look at Q scores. You may have heard the word Q score uh, bandied about in everyday conversation when talking about celebrities. Q-score is an attempt to measure the overall likingness of a celebrity, athlete, or cartoon or comic book character amongst those people who are aware of that celebrity, athlete, or comic book character. The way Q-scores are measured is rather easy. People are asked to take a Q-score survey. They're presented names of various individuals, and then they simply score them as one of their favorites. Very good, good, fair, poor or they say they never seen or heard this person before. From this, we can actually derive an individual's uh, Q score. So first, we take all the individuals who completed the survey. Then we count up the total number of people who scored the celebrity or athlete or cartoon character anything other than never seen them before. This means that they were at least familiar with the individual. Then we count up the total number of people who said it's this individual is one of their favorites. If we take the total familiar divided by the total number of responses, we know the percentage of people who said they were at least familiar with the individual. If we take the total number of people who said that individual was their favorite and divide it by the total number of responses, we get the percentage of total favorite. Then we take the percentage of total favorite divide it by the percentage familiar, and we derive the Q-score. This can range from 0 to 100. Let's illustrate how this might actually be used by a marketing researcher. Let's imagine that a marketer is looking to license the rights to use a particular comic book character for a product that they intend to sell targeting mothers with young children. Well, here we have the Q-score results specific for mothers with children that are 2 to 5 years old. In the overall uh, cartoon comic book, world of individuals amongst mothers with children two to five year old, the Q score is typically an odd score of 19. But let's take a closer look at the comic book characters Iron Man, Batman, Superman, and Deadpool. Here we see Q scores of 35, 32, 25, and 11. If the presumption is that we want to license a comic book character that's popular and liked by mothers that have children two to five years old, it's rather apparent that Iron Man and Batman perform relatively high and should be part of the consideration, whereas Superman doesn't perform nearly as well, and Deadpool, despite I liking him, doesn't perform nearly as well compared to the other ones we were considering. Sorry, Deadpool. 